This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad and live today. School is back in session, and this time of year always takes me back to the days of my first day of school. You know, those exciting moments when you meet your new teacher for the very first time, when you see friends that you hadn't seen all summer long, and the excitement around a new outfit for that first day of school. But there was also some nervousness that was involved as well. Will I know how to maneuver through the hallways of the school? Will I remember how to do my homework? And most importantly, what if I'm selected dead last when it comes to choosing teams for the pickup football game during recess? Oh yes, we all know how the selection of teams goes when it comes to the playground. Two team captains standing out there in front of all the kids as they start to pick who they want to be on their team. Now back then, I was a pretty athletic guy, but I was very small in stature, so I never quite knew where I would end up in this mix. Most of the time, I would typically fall somewhere in the middle of the pack, but there were those few occasions when it was coming down to the wire. I didn't want to be the last one selected. I didn't want to be Mr. Irrelevant, so to speak. Oh, the embarrassment of carrying that title. There was nothing worse than when there were two kids left to be selected, and you heard one of those team captains say, okay, and then I'll take Tommy, which means that you get Eric. <sighs> nothing is worse than being selected last or being a mere afterthought. In our gospel reading for today, a Syrophoenician woman approaches Jesus and throws herself at his feet and begs him to cast out the demon that is residing in her daughter. Now this is a story of great magnitude because this woman is not Jewish. She's a Gentile. And here she is pleading with a Jew to help her out. You see, the Jews were God's chosen people the ones that God selected first when he made promises of prosperity to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. These were the all-stars. The Gentiles, they weren't even selected. They were truly an afterthought that had no business even being on the playing field with these Jews and being in a relationship with God. But this woman, she's desperate. She's willing to stick her neck out even if it means to heap some embarrassment upon herself. Jesus sticks to the party line when he says to this woman, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and to throw it down to the dogs. Meaning that the Jews were the chosen people of God, not the Gentiles. They get first dibs on this message of salvation and love which Jesus brings to the people. It isn't just right to throw it down to the dogs, so to speak. Now, I think it is rather curious to think about how Jesus is exactly saying all this. Does he really believe what he's saying? Is he being sarcastic in nature? Is he testing this woman? What is his body language like as he's saying this? Or what are his facial expressions like? You know, we just don't know. But what we do know is that this woman does have a zinger for Jesus. She replies, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Aha, there you go. The message might not have been tailored for the Gentiles' ears in the beginning, but it is making its way to them because the Jews have rejected Jesus, they've rejected the message, or maybe they've rejected both. It's like the chosen people of God. They're having a pizza party for dinner and taking their crusts and throwing them down to the family dog sitting under the table. You know what? This isn't the good part. I don't really want it. I reject it. You can have it if you truly want it that badly. And this Gentile woman, she's just eating it up. She knows of Jesus' power. She knows who he is. She knows what he is capable of, and she knows that he is something special. 
someone who is able to do great and mighty things. She is just not going to sit around being patient, waiting for God's heavenly food. She's asking for it. She's being proactive and she says, your message is for the Jews. Well, you know what? They don't want it. But I do. Please, sir, give it to me. Heal my daughter over here and restore her life. Jesus sees this woman's faith and he realizes that she is right. God's grace isn't just for the ones who are out on the playing field. It is for the ones who are standing on the sideline, those who are up in the stands, those who are way out in the parking lot. It's even for those at home who could care less about the game. The love and salvation that comes to us through Jesus Christ is for all people, whether they deserve it or not, whether they want it or not, whether they are aware of it or not. God shows no partiality when it comes to his people. And this is what gospel writer Mark conveys to us through this story. Jesus comes for all people, period. No questions asked. All we have to do is have faith that the promise it's for us. It doesn't matter where we fall in the pecking order, for Jesus plays no favorites. We are all chosen in our baptisms because we believe. There are no exclusions. While our gospel text for today is a pure proclamation of God's love for us, the author of the book of James takes things one step further in his letter. He says that a living Christian faith expresses itself in acts of compassion and mercy for those who are in need. Now he uses the example of two people entering into an assembly, you know, entering into a church building, one wearing fine clothes and jewelry and the other in dirty, ragged out clothes. He warns that reader to be careful what distinctions you make between these two people and how you might go about judging them. Don't offer that individual who's dressed really nicely the best seat in the house based on these outwardly appearances. And likewise, don't neglect that poor person. We are not to be judges of others. In fact, James says, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? When I was working at a church in Florida, there was a homeless man that wanted to speak to our senior pastor. I told him that the senior pastor was busy preparing for church, but that this guy should come and join us in worship, and then he could speak to the senior pastor following the service. Well, the man, he just shook his head sadly and said, No, nah, I can't go in there. I smell like an old goat. You see, this guy had this preconceived notion that he would be judged if he set foot in that sanctuary building. And you know what? He was probably right. He would have gotten a few stares because he wasn't like everyone else in the sanctuary. James tells us that we are not to judge, but rather we are to fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That homeless guy, he is just as chosen as each and every one of us. It is up to us to make him feel welcomed and loved, just as Christ loves all of our broken and dysfunctional selves. We need redemption and we need love, something that only Jesus can provide. And when we receive his grace and his mercy, it then falls within our realm of responsibility to go out and to share this love with others through our actions and our deeds. As gospel writer Mark communicates to us, if Jesus can demonstrate God's love to even a Syrophoenician woman, then certainly he provides that same love to each one of us who believes. Thankfully, we are all not standing there nervously on the playground waiting to be selected by Jesus to be a part of his team. The teams are set. 
and all believers are welcome to take an active role in proclaiming this wonderful gift given to us through the cross. Jesus has chosen us. We are his. To God be the glory. Amen. Remember as you go about your day that yesterday is gone. Tomorrow does not yet belong to you. So why not live today knowing that you never walk alone? See y'all next week. Later.